Let's turn to Psalm 12. Psalm 12 is titled To the Chief Musician on an Eight-Stringed Harp, a Psalm of David. Now, like Psalm 6, this one too is written specifically for the eight-stringed harp, the Seminith. And in this psalm, David complains about the vicious words of his enemies and contrasts them with the pure words of God. Again, we have two opposing um, forces, you may say. Uh, it begins in verse uh, 1 and 2 by saying, Help, Lord, help, Lord, for the godly man sees it, for the faithful man fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The psalm begins with a very important word, and it's a word that I have uh, often called the shortest uh, prayer, and that is help. Help. And it means that there is a serious problem, and it means that we need God to fix it, to help us out. So what's the problem? The problem is that the godly man is disappearing. The faithful are gone. That's the problem. And it's interesting that David identifies the problem not in the first place by the presence of the wicked, but by the absence of the godly, of the faithful. And in these last days of the Laodicean, watered-down, lukewarm church, where Bibles and crosses and prayer have been removed from the public space, and where Christianity is regarded offensive and uh, not inclusive, and thus needs to be suppressed. In this time we have the same problem that David saw. The godly have disappeared. And Jesus foretold us that it would be this way. In Matthew 24, verse 12, he said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And if you read this, even what David wrote uh, 3,000 years ago, and what we observe today in the world, you can only imagine how it will be when the restrainer is completely removed. Now David had to deal not only with physical persecution, but also with gossip, with lies, with slanderous words, with deceptive talking. It comes back in several of his psalms. And uh, this, again, is very recognizable in, in this woke world that we uh, live in, where there's a war of words going on. Our words are, uh, our words as Christians are uh, considered offensive, discriminating, non-inclusive, hate speech, bigotry. But they, the woke ones, they can say whatever they want. And they can even demand, and backed by law, uh, how we ought to speak. And on top of that we see also the flattering lips in church and in Christianity. Those who know how to use the right vocabulary, who always have the right answer, and say what others hope to hear. From their words you would think that they are the perfect Christians. But their discernment and their fruit speaks differently. They do not belong to the godly, to the faithful. David continues, verse 3, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? David realized that it is useless to try and debate to stop the evil speakers. In their pride they seem unstoppable. They are convinced that they will prevail. They say, literally, who can stop us? And uh, that shows how godless they are. Who is Lord over us, they say. Well, David knew the answer to that. It's the Lord God. And he will cut off the flattering lips and the proud tongue. This is something also for us to remember, to leave this to God and not go into uh, endless and vain and senseless debates and arguments. Leave it to God. He will cut off the flattering lips and the proud tongue. Verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. 
I will set him in safety from him that buffeted at him. Here is the answer to the prideful question, who is Lord over us? Well, God has allowed it so far, and then he says, now I will arise. And by now we are familiar with this phrase, I will arise. It means that God will have victory. It's not I will give it a try, I will give a shot at it, no, I will have victory. God sits on his throne, but when he arises, in his might the earth shakes and his enemies will not stand. And God does so on behalf of the poor and the needy. Verse 6 then, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from his from this generation forever. What a contrast. Contrary to the flattering lips that utter lies and uh, decep deception and slander, the word of God is pure, as if purified not two or three times, but seven times. God's word has literally survived the furnace of persecution, criticism, science and history. And pure it stands. It's still an all-time bestseller. A blessing to those who read and hear it, leading to salvation. And Paul writes in Romans 10 verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And you see that therefore it's of utter importance that the word of God is pure and um, has stand the test of time, criticism and science. And indeed, from David's days uh, and before, God has kept and pre preserved his word. There is no historical document that is so well preserved, of which are so many uh, copies throughout the ages uh, been made and preserved. Um, there is no historical document um, that is uh, so accurate and accurately preserved. It is his word and it will stand forever. In Matthew 5 verse 18 it says, for Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. The psalm then um, ends with the way of the wicked in spite of this, in spite of the pure word of God. It says, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Men will exalt vileness uh, in spite of the pure word of God. And it's not a devaluation of God's word, but it is proof of the wickedness of men. And we should not be disheartened by it. We know that God will arise. And uh, when it's really too much for us, we may cry out to God, as David did, even if it is just with one word, help. Be sure God will arise. Amen. Amen.